So what's going on guys, DIY Dan, Saltwater Junkie here again, and in this video I'm going to be making a DIY power strip. Now a lot of you might ask, why not just go get a regular power strip? But the difference in most power strips and this one is that I can control each outlet individually with a switch. This makes aquarium maintenance much easier. For example, a protein skimmer, if you need to drain the container, Instead of having to dig around and figure out which cord so you can unplug it on the protein skimmer, all you do is flip the switch, you can do your maintenance, and then flip the switch back on. That's why I like everything on a switch. I use it on my algae scrubber pumps, my UV sterilizers, uh, some of my return pumps, uh, just for all aspects of aquarium maintenance to make it easier so I don't have to get frustrated trying to figure out what cord is what. So I've actually built two of these before. This one I built two years ago and this one about three years ago. So the main reason I am building this one is because those other two work so well. And even if you're not that familiar with electricity, after this video, I feel you will be able to put one of these together if you choose to do so. So in this video, guys, I'm going to be going over some basic electrical knowledge that you will need to put something like this together. Also, the tools and supplies you will need. I'm also going to go over a wiring diagram to explain how to wire it in because it's going to be much easier to see it on that than it is on the actual build. Then I'm gonna go over helpful tips and mistakes I made during this process so you don't make the same mistakes as I did. And then at the end of this video, there's gonna be a full assembly of the actual power strip in fast forward if you wanna stick around for that. So this is a pretty long video guys because it's loaded with all kinds of information, but here is a chapter index if you wanna bypass some of the stuff that you really don't need to watch. So I don't waste your time. So let's get to it. So now I'm going to go over some basic electrical knowledge as far as how to wire in the electrical outlets, switches, uh, what power cords to use, what power cords not to use to supply this power strip. Uh, some of this stuff is pretty basic knowledge, but if you've never done this before, then I feel you should watch it. If you have wired in switches and outlets, you can probably bypass to the next section of this video, which takes place at 11 minutes and 20 seconds. I did feel I needed to get pretty basic on this stuff just because we are messing with electricity and if you don't know what you're doing, you could cause some issues. That being said, one of the most critical things to make sure of is that your power cord that you're using to supply the power strip has a larger gauge wire than anything you're planning on running off of it. Now how you can tell of what gauge wire and how big it is is on every extension cord, every power cord, it will tell you on the cord itself what gauge wire it has in it. So right here I'm going to give you a couple examples off of the stuff that I'm running off of my power strip. So it's going to tell you the number of wires that are in the cord and the gauge of the wire. This is a 2 times 18 HWG, meaning this cord has two wires that are 18 gauge wire. This cord is for my UV sterilizer light. And right here it says 18 AWG times three, meaning 18 gauge wire and three wires. So this is one aspect where I play it super safe. I ended up using two 14 gauge power cords to supply this power strip. And I know that sounds backwards, but when it comes to wire size, the smaller the number, the bigger the cable is. So just to show you how overkill I went with my power strip as far as the supply power cords, here is a six outlet power strip. And right here you can see it is running 14 AWG times three, meaning 14 gauge wire, three wire. If you end up using a smaller size or even the same size wire for the supply power cord to your power strip, and then running that same size wire for multiple items, you could overload that supply power cord, which creates heat and could possibly lead to a fire hazard if your circuit breaker doesn't trip. The next thing I'm going to get into is your power cord and what the three wires are that you're going to be using to supply the power strip. Now the most common colors of wire that are going to be in a three wire 110 extension cord or power cord are going to be white, green, and black. The green is going to be your ground, the white is going to be your neutral or common, and the black wire is the hot wire. And on the actual plug-in part, the round is the ground, the big spade on the plug is the common or neutral, and the small spade on the plug is the hot wire. As far as the switches go, they are about the simplest thing on this project. 
you have the ground stud on one side and you have basically your hot line coming in and your load going out on the other. As far as the outlets go, the small slot is for your hot wire and therefore the studs on this side would be for your black wire. And the big slot is your common or neutral wire and therefore the studs on that side are for your white wire. And then of course you have the ground on that green stud at the bottom. And on almost every outlet I believe it's also going to be labeled on the back side of the outlet. Now I'm going to go over the different ways you can connect the wire to these outlets and switches. This would be the first way where you just push the wire into these holes. However, I've seen that not make a very good connection and I have never put wires in these holes like this. This is by far the easiest way to attach the wires to this outlet, but is definitely not the best or the safest way to do it. The way that I recommend attaching the wire to the outlet is to strip back about three quarters of an inch of the wire. Then using a pair of needle nose, bend it to a hook. You're going to put that hook around it the same direction you would tighten the bolt. So around it in a clockwise motion. If you put it the wrong direction, it has an easier chance of spreading open as you tighten it down. A couple things to watch out for is that the insulation is not under the bolt as you tighten it. And that the hook that you made is not spreading as you tighten it down. If that happens, loosen it back off. Tighten your hook with a pair of needle nose and then tighten it back down. Either of these things could lead to a bad connection which again could create heat and a possible fire hazard. When attaching the wires to the switches, these switches had a little cover plate underneath the bolt head and therefore I just stripped back a little bit less wire and put them side by side and tighten that cover plate down to sandwich them between that plate and the housing of the switch. After tightening it down, it's a good idea to give them a good tug to make sure you don't feel any kind of looseness. And if you do, tighten them down a little bit more. On the load side of the switch, you will only be putting one wire on. And therefore, you can just put it on the one side of the stud. And you can still just tighten that bolt down and it will sandwich it with plenty of strength. If you don't like the idea of sandwiching the one wire, you could always do the hook and put it between the bolt and the cover plate. The other thing you want to make sure of is you don't have too much bare wire hanging out past the switch or outlet because that could short out to something and cause a fire hazard as well. I also bend the wire to a hook to put the grounds on the switches and the outlets. You can also use a pair of needle nose to tighten the hook down before tightening it down with the screwdriver. I also had to use a couple wire nuts for this project. So what I'm going to do here is just give you a reference. I'm cutting these four wires and trimming the insulation off so I can show you how I put these wire nuts on. As far as how much insulation to trim off is going to depend on how many wires you're putting together and what size of wire nut you are having to use. Basically, you don't want the bare wire sticking out below the wire nut when you tighten it all the way down because then it could short out to a hot wire. However, you don't want to not trim enough insulation off because you do not want the wire nut tightening down on that insulation because that will give you a bad connection. With smaller wire, you can twist the wires together into each other before putting the wire nut on. However, with these bigger wires, that is hard to do. So all I do is make sure they are all plumb to each other, then get a wire nut that will start threading down and it will basically pull those wires together because it is a tapered thread. So as you tighten it, it pulls them tighter and tighter together. You will need a variety of wire nuts depending on how many wires you're trying to put together or what size wire they are. Too small of a wire nut and you will not be able to get all of the ends of the wire into it to get it started. Too big of a wire nut and you will not be able to tighten it down and possibly cause a bad connection. When tightening down the wire nuts by hand, you should not be able to keep turning that wire nut. It should basically stop where you can no longer tighten it down any further. If you can continuously spin that wire nut, then you have too big of a wire nut and you need to go to the next size smaller. When I've used wire nuts on very big wire, I've even used a pair of pliers to tighten those down to make sure that I have a good positive connection. You can also wrap some electrical tape around the wires and the wire nut 
But if you do it properly and tighten them down correctly, you should not have to do this. Here is an example of a wire nut that's too big because it is not stopping me from spinning it by hand. The other thing you're going to need to do for this project is break off a tab on the outlets and that's what's going to allow us to individually control each outlet. In order to break off that tab all you need is a pair of needle nose pliers. Grab that tab and then wiggle the outlet back and forth until it breaks it off. So I went ahead and did that to all four of my outlets before wiring anything in. So I did not have to use a GFCI outlet on my power strip because I was protected at the wall with one where it was plugged into. If this is not the case with where you're plugging yours in, it might be a good idea for you to add one of these. So I'm gonna go over how you can wire this in in the wiring diagram. On the GFCI outlet, you actually have a line side, hot and common, and then a load side, hot and common. The supply power from your power cord would go into the line side of this outlet, and then the other outlets or switches you run after that would go on the load side. And that ground fault protects everything after this GFCI outlet. I highly recommend adding one of these to your power strip if it's not already GFCI protected at the wall. So now I'm gonna go over the tools and supplies you'll need to do a project like this. And remember, you can modify this project bigger, smaller, whatever you need for your application. So this did end up being a pretty pricey project, guys, for two reasons. One is it's 2022 and the price of raw materials is absolutely ridiculous. And the second is on the other two builds that I did, I was able to use a lot more stuff that I already had around the house and I didn't have to go buy as much. So believe it or not, on this table right here, which is the majority of what I used to put this project together, did end up costing me about $100. Now the reason I was able to save so much money before, and I've gone over this in some of my other saltwater videos, is I tend to use leftover power cords and stuff off of old appliances. However, I had ran out of those. So just those two power cords that I used were $30 between the two of them. The wire that I ended up buying because I didn't have any wire around the house was $15. So just those couple things alone added up to about 50 bucks. And usually I would not have had to spend that. I just didn't have any around the house at the time. The electrical switches were a couple bucks a piece. Same goes for the outlets. However, the GFCI outlets are about 15 to 20 bucks a piece if you end up deciding to add that to your power strip. And the face plates were about three or four bucks a piece as well. Now the two things I did have laying around the house was this piece of PVC board, and that's about 12 bucks for an eight foot stick. The other thing that I had laying around the house was this piece of corrugated plastic, and that's about the same cost as that PVC board, about 10 to $15 for a sheet. So I started out by drawing the entire power strip, but it's basically two power strips in one. So I only drew one half of it to make it easier to see and explain. And basically you're just gonna duplicate that if you wanna make the exact same thing as I did. All right guys, so we've got our power cord here. I'm gonna start with the common. Now obviously the common is the white wire. However, I can't draw a white wire on a white board. So I used orange for the common. We're going to come around to the first outlet on the big slot side to one of the studs and attach that wire. Then we're going to make a jumper wire from the other stud over to the second outlet on that big slot side and put it on one of those studs. And that's all we have to do for the common. So now we're going to run the ground, which is your round pull at the bottom of the plug or outlet. And on these, I ran individual wires because there's not two studs. So it's kind of a pain to jump from stud to stud. Uh, so I basically came down with individual wires off of each stud and then I used a wire nut. I attached the ground from the power cord, all three of the first three switches, and then I ran an extra jumper wire over to here and ran this switch and these two outlets all to that wire nut. So that's how I did the ground. So that is safely grounding everything in this power strip. The hot wire, which is your small slot on your plug or outlet, we're coming around and I ran it over to the switch that's next to the outlets and then I made a jumper to the next switch, jumper to the next switch, jumper to the final switch. 
Then off of the first switch, I ran the power wire or hot wire around to the small slot side, top stud. And I go over this, I don't know if you watched that part of the video, but you have to break the little tab and that isolates this outlet from this outlet so we can power them individually. So if you didn't see that part of the video, you can go back and watch it. Then we go from our second switch over to the bottom stud of that first outlet, third switch to the top of the second outlet, fourth switch to the bottom stud of that outlet. And that's pretty much all there is. And basically duplicate that is what I did for the one that I made. Now my protein skimmer, the reason I put this on here is it's not actually ran. I'm using a 12 volt relay because I've got my protein skimmer on a shutdown. I have a remote container, so I don't have to pull the top of the canister off all the time. And that's wired a little differently. So this is actually uh, two separate wires that have nothing to do with AC voltage. So that's ran a little differently. And if you wanna see that video, I'll post it at the end of this one. So if you're not ground fault protected at the outlet that's powering your aquarium, I highly recommend you add a GFCI outlet to this power strip. So right here I erased these because this was our hot wire going to there and this was our common going to there. So now our common is gonna go up and attach to your line. Your hot is gonna come up and attach to your line. Then we're gonna come off of the load side with the common and go and, and put it to the other outlets. And we're gonna come off of the load side with the hot and attach it to your hot lead, which is now gonna power your switches and power your outlets. And then you would add your ground and since I have one less wire, I'll put it into this wire, not right here. So obviously this GFCI would have constant power, but these four outlets, you're still gonna be able to control with these switches. And now you are completely ground fault protected by that GFCI on your power strip. The reason I did not do these on my power strips is because I ran the electrical that is running my aquariums and I ground fault protected those at the wall. So my power strip is protected from the wall outlet that it is running off of. So now I'm gonna be running through the full assembly and fast forward with a quick description as we go here. Right here, I'm just wiring the supply hot wire going into the bottom of the switches and jumping it from switch to switch. I wired everything together with the switches just on the table. This made it much easier. However, there's a couple things that did backfire on me that I did not see because they were not in the box as I did it. I jumped the hot wire to all four switches on both sides and then got one piece of my PVC board, drilled a hole in it to run the supply power cords through and hooked that hot wire from the power cord to one of the switches on each side of the power strip to supply power to all four switches that were jumped together. Using a pair of needle nose pliers, I broke off the tab on the hot side of each one of the outlets so I could control them individually and then hooked a wire from the load side of each one of the switches to each one of the studs on that small slot side of each one of the outlets. You could also just wire a switch to control each outlet of two and that way you would not have to break the tabs on the outlets and you would only have to use half the amount of switches that I did. Then I hooked up the neutral wire to the outlets. I made a jumper from outlet to outlet on each side, then hooked the white wire from the power supply cord up to each one of those outlets on each side of the power strip. After that, all that's left to do is hook up the ground wire to each one of the switches and outlets. So right here, I ran that individual ground wire to each switch and to each outlet. Then using a couple wire nuts and a jumper ground, I hooked all of those together along with the ground from the power supply cord. And that way everything is safely grounded together.
So being as though my protein skimmer is actually wired using a 12 volt relay for my safety shutdown on that protein skimmer, it is wired a little differently. So I had to run a separate two wire harness into the power distribution box for the switch that controls my protein skimmer. I butt connected some ends on that cord for the protein skimmer because it was the flexible wire or the stranded wire, not the solid wire to make them hold better on the switch. I also did this on the power supply wires for the hot and common for the same reason. I did not have to do it to the ground because the ground wire was going directly into a wire nut. That's about it for the wiring guys. Then I laid out the cover plates side by side so I could figure out how long I needed to cut my piece of PVC board for the top and bottom of the box. I also made it a little longer and put some spacers between the cover plates so I had a little bit more room to stash the extra wiring. I secured all four corners of the box using drywall screws and I countersunk the holes so they would be flush with the outside of the box. I removed all of the bolts from the outlets and switches because that would not work for my application. Then I placed the switch in the first spot, put the cover plate on top of it to make sure it was going to look good, and then pre-drilled the holes for the cover plate into the PVC board. Then I drilled them out with a little bit bigger drill bit because they are not screwing into the PVC board, they will be screwing into the switch or outlet. And I just needed enough room for that bolt for the cover plate to be able to thread down tight onto the switch. So apparently I forgot to hit record when I was anchoring the actual switch to the PVC board, but we'll get to that again on the rest of these switches and outlets in a second. Once getting my protein switch mounted, I went ahead and put it in one of my spacers, which is just another piece of that one by two material. I used one screw on the top and one screw on the bottom to hold those spacers in place. However, I did not do the screw centered in the board. I offset them one on one side on the top and then on the other side on the bottom and that helped keep that board from twisting. I set the cover plate in place, did the pilot bit and then drilled them out a little bigger. Then I went ahead and set the switches in place and removed all the original bolts from the outlets and the switches. So one thing I didn't think about when putting all the wires on these switches and outlets is I didn't account for the spacer between the switches and the outlets. So I did end up having to make a couple wires longer and redoing them. As far as anchoring the switches on this PVC board, what I ended up doing is since those holes were drilled for the cover plate, that gave me a guide to set the switch where it's gonna go. And then I just used some small screws and drilled and tapered them into the PVC board to hold the switches in place. This does take some patience and I recommend using smaller screws than what the holes are in the switches. So you can loosen them up and adjust them a little bit if the cover plate doesn't quite line up correctly. Now this is a very tight tolerance to where the PVC board has to be above and below that switch and you don't have much clearance. I did taper some of the screws because they were so close to the edge of the PVC board. I had thought about using some regular electrical boxes, but I just don't like the way those plastic ones look. I thought this had a much cleaner look and that's why I went with it. So that's pretty much how I assembled this guys. While I'm finishing this up, I'm going to go over some other helpful tips and some other mistakes I made. One of those mistakes was the power supply cord that I put for the first set of switches and outlets. I attached to the first switch that's next to the protein skimmer switch. That ended up being a mistake because I had to run the neutral wire a lot longer. So I ended up moving and putting that power supply to the fourth switch, which was right next to the outlet and just made the wiring easier. So if those cover plates didn't end up lining up, I would just loosen the screws a little bit, move the switch or outlet the direction it needed to go and then tighten them back down and try the cover again. If you wanted to make that process a little bit easier to manage, you could just get, instead of having the four outlets on each cover plate, just get ones that do two or even individual ones. And then you don't have to worry about being so precise with anchoring the switches to have them all line up correctly. One other note guys is I do recommend on something like this using ground wire that does have the insulation on the wire because you are tucking these wires in pretty tight.
and you don't want one accidentally going over if you're using bare wire and touching the hot. So once I got all the cover plates on, I flipped it over and just tucked all the wiring in. It's a good thing I put those spacers in there because those wire nuts did take up some space. When tidying up my wires, I try and do my best to keep the neutral and the ground to one side and the hot wires away from it. You can only do so much, and as long as there's no bare wires possibly touching each other, then it doesn't really matter, but it's just something I try and do if possible. For the backing material, I used that corrugated PVC board that I showed you in the supplies earlier in this video. And all I did was cut that to size and then use some short screws to anchor through that corrugated plastic into the PVC board. So if you're planning on putting this power strip in an extremely moist area like underneath an aquarium stand with a sump, I would highly recommend putting some silicone between the backing material and the PVC board to kind of waterproof it. And after a couple months of running it, I would recommend taking the backing off and just making sure that it doesn't look like any corrosion is starting to build up or anything like that, showing that there's moisture starting to gather inside that power box. The reason I did not silicone mine is my fish room is very well ventilated. It is not in a sealed aquarium stand. And I took the power distribution box off that I built three years ago and looked at it to make sure that it didn't show any signs of moisture affecting it. This is coming from personal experience. I used to run an external little giant pump and the moisture actually caught that pump on fire because that aquarium stand was so well sealed. I actually came home after work to my tank not circulating, wondering what happened, then opened this cabinet, had a horrible electrical burnt smell, and I feel very lucky that this didn't end up catching my house on fire or the aquarium stand, etc. And after this happened is actually when I moved my sumps into the other rooms so they were better ventilated. It's also when I decided to add more electrical for my aquariums and add that GFCI outlet because if there was a GFCI on that, I don't think that would have caught on fire. Once getting the backing on, all that's left to do is figure out how you want to secure the power strip in place. For mine, I had some leftover 1x3 PVC board, and I just made a couple brackets that basically set it on top of my aquarium sump box. I did space that bracket up a little bit so I could run the power cords between the power strip and the sump box. So that's going to wrap it up for this video, guys. Once again, if you enjoyed it and it gave you some good information, please hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I'd really appreciate it. The whole concept of my channel is to give you guys the most information in the least amount of time as possible so I don't waste your time and save you money by doing it yourselves. Hope to see you next time. Have a good one. Later.